Do me a favor and take your Bibles and turn to two passages of Scripture in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 2. Put your finger there and also turn to Romans chapter 12 in the New Testament, Genesis chapter 2 and Romans chapter 12. So let me ask you this morning, a little exercise. How long can you hold your breath? All right, so, so let's, let's test it out this morning, okay? Here we go. I'm going to count to three, and I want all of us to hold our breath this morning, and we'll see how long we can do it. Ready? One, two, three. Silence over all the building. You can breathe in. That was just, uh, that was just to see how obedient you are. What an, what, an, uh, what an obedient crowd. Most of us, even the most physically fit of us, can probably only hold our breath between two and three minutes. I think the world record is somewhere around 22 minutes. And David Blaine, the musician, I think, was underwater on a TV program for like 17 minutes and supposedly didn't breathe all of that time. I think you would agree with me, right? Breathing is an all-day, everyday experience. Do you agree with me on that? If I told you today, okay, go home today, and I only want you to breathe breathe every other hour, could you survive that way? Or if I told you, hey, let's do this, only breathe on Sundays. So Sunday is the only day you can breathe, and the rest of the week I want you to hold your breath. You'd sit back and say, Brian, I cannot survive that way. In order to live, I have to breathe. Breathing is an all-day Every day experience. Here's what I want you to catch today. The Bible says that worship is just like breathing. The psalmist said it this way in Psalm 150 and verse 6. He says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. And so just as you breathe to live... God desires for us to worship to live. I said it this way, just as you must breathe to physically survive, so we must worship to spiritually survive. One writer that I was reading this week said this, said, we breathe in grace and we breathe out praise. Isn't that beautiful? So so think with me for just a moment. We breathe in God's grace, his undeserved favor upon our lives. So do me a favor, take a deep, big breath as if you were breathing in the grace of God. Take a deep breath and breathe in his grace. We breathe in grace and we breathe out praise. But I believe we have an erroneous view of what worship is. If I asked you today to define worship, some of you would say, why, worship is singing. That's what it is. What we did is, what we just did is the way that we worship. And no doubt, singing is worship. But in your mind, singing is all there is to worship. Others would say, why, worship happens on Sunday mornings. We actually call our our service, the service, our worship service. And if we're not careful, we, we create the idea that worship only happens between 10 o'clock and 1130 on Sunday mornings. And so worship happens during that worship experience. And then we go home, we put worship in our pockets, we put worship in a little box, and we don't worship anymore. Or maybe you would sit back and say, boy, worship just happens at church. That's where I worship. We worship at church as if here we're the only place where you and I can worship. Let me me define worship. we got just a little bit of a ring, guys, if we can eliminate that ring. Uh, Let me define worship for you today. And this is in your outline, and I want you to catch it. Biblical worship is the whole life response, head, heart, and hands to who God is and what he has done. 
Let, let me say it again because that's so important. Worship is, worship is the whole life response, head, heart, and hands. And we could say feet and knees and elbows and wisdom teeth and ears, even ears that have hair on the inside of them. Head, heart, hands, all of us. It is a whole life response to who God is and what he has done for us. Two weeks ago, we began a series that we've titled, Your Work Matters. The premise is this, that God is just as interested in what you do on Monday as he is what you do today on Sunday. We tried, to, we tried to blow away that sacred, secular divide and show that everything matters to God. There is no sacred and there is no secular. We talked about the fact that everything in your life that is not sin can be considered worship. There is no sacred, secular divide. Pastor Jose last week talked out of Genesis chapter 1, and he talked about the cultural mandate. And he talked about our original job description, the fact that, that you and I were placed here for a purpose, and, and God told us to multiply and replenish the earth and have dominion over it. He gave us a job. He gave us a responsibility. Today we want to look at a unique concept that maybe you've never seen in Scripture before. We want to talk about the fact that your work is worship. What you do, not just Sunday morning between 10 and 11.30, but what you do every day of the week when you get up in the morning and you go to work, that is worship. If you're doing it with a right our heart attitude and, and you're using the gifts that God has given to you and me. So if you have your outlines in front of you, the first thing that I want us to see, and we'll look at Scripture in just a moment, is the simple truth is this, that God intended for your work to be an act of worship. Now, you might struggle with that because you might sit back today and say, Brian, I'm a painter. How can painting a house be an act of worship? Or, Brian, I'm an airline pilot. How can being a pilot be an act of worship? Or, Brian, or, Brian I'm a waitress. How can being a waitress be an act of worship? Or, I'm a teacher. How can being a teacher be an act of worship? Here's what I submit to you this morning, and we will see from Scripture, that God is intended for your work what you do Monday to Friday or whatever your work schedule is, God has intended for your work to be an act of worship. We see that truth in the very beginning, all the way back in the Garden of Eden. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Genesis chapter 2. We're going to read verses 15, 16, and 17 and put it in context today. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. It says, and the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden. What does he say? He did it, he did it to do what? To work it and to keep it. Would you read that verse with me again? Let's read it. Can we go back to that verse? Let's read verse 15 all together. The Lord God took man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. Verse 16. And the Lord commanded the man, saying... You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Would you pray with me for just a moment? Lord, I pray right now that the Holy Spirit of God would illuminate our minds, illuminate our hearts. God, help us to know you better and not only know you better, but know what you expect of us. And I pray that you would be honored and glorified through our lives, not just today, but tomorrow and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday. There's somebody here today that is not a follower of Jesus Christ. They've never by faith placed their faith and trust in Jesus. I pray that today they would do that. Thank you for speaking to us this morning, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The first thing you might notice, if you understand uh, the order and the chronology of the book of Genesis, is that work 
is not the result of the fall. Jose alluded to that last week. The fall takes place in Genesis chapter 3, and, and we have often taught, I believe at some point in ministry I've taught as well, that, man, if it wasn't for Adam and Eve's sin, we'd be sitting in paradise today with our feet up, drinking a virgin pina colada, looking out over everything, and just enjoying paradise. That old Adam and Eve blew it for us. Because of their sin, I got to go to work on Monday. But notice in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15, before the fall, God gives man and woman a responsibility. He places them in the garden and he says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to work it. I want you to keep it. I want you to take care of it. It's interesting, the word work there in chapter 2 and verse 15 is the Hebrew word avidah. It's a, it's a really interesting word. It's a word that is used throughout the Old Testament. It's used in reference to work over and over again. Exodus chapter um, 34 and verse 21, God said, six days you shall work, and on the seventh day you shall rest. The word work there is the Hebrew word Avidah, the same word that's found in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15. Psalm 104 verse 23 says, man goes out to his work and his labor until the evening. Same word, Hebrew word Avidah. It's interesting though that the word is not just translated work throughout the Old Testament. The Hebrew word Avidah is often translated work worship as well. Let me show you two verses. Exodus chapter 8 and verse 1. The Israelites were under bondage by the Egyptians and God wanted to free them. And so the message was given to Pharaoh, let my people go so that they may worship me. Guess what word is used? Avidah. The same word that's in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15. Joshua 24 and verse 15, you're maybe familiar with the verse where Joshua made that great statement, as for me in my house, we will, depending upon the translation that you have, we will worship or serve the Lord. It's interesting, this word is used scores of times all throughout the Old Testament, and it's used interchangeably either for work or for worship. Those are its two meanings. What does that mean for us? What does that signify for us? The simple truth is this, God's original design and God's original desire is that our work and our worship would be a seamless way of living. In other words, we would worship while we work and we would work while we worship. There would be no distinction there. It's not like, well, I'm going to work or I'm going to worship. I worship while I'm working and I work while I am worshiping. They're not two separate things. They're the exact same thing. Remember, those of us that are older probably remember that song, Whistle While You Work. Remember that? All right, I'm not a good whistler, so I can't do it very well. All right, whistle while you work. Well, what if we change that to worship while you work? And not only worship while you work, but worship as you work. That, that, that's what God is, is telling Adam and Eve there in the Garden of Eden. I've given you a responsibility, and as you tend and take care of the garden, you are worshiping me. So you and I sit back today and say, so how does that apply to us, Brian? I don't live in the Garden of Eden. My, my job is not that of a gardener. How does, how does Genesis 2.15 apply to us? Let me give you a couple of points if you're following along. The first is this. Like Adam and Eve, you are commanded to work the garden God has given to you. You and I, like Adam and Eve, are commanded to work the garden that God has given to us. 
J.D. Greer, who's a pastor and now actually is the president of the Southern Baptist Convention, speaking on this passage, reminds us that we're not park rangers, we're gardeners. He said, God didn't make you a park ranger over your gardener. A park ranger does what? He just drives around and makes sure everything's okay. Now, if you're a park ranger today, I'm certainly not minimizing your job, all right? I know there's many park rangers in South Florida, and I'm sure they work. I'm sure they work hard. But the job of a park ranger is not necessarily to get down and get his hands dirty and do the gardening and do all of that. And J.D. Greer says that in the garden that God has given to us, we are not park rangers. We are gardeners. Our job is not just to guard our garden. Our job is to work it. So I'd ask you today, where is the garden that God has given to you? Think about that for just a moment. And you know I'm talking metaphorically. I'm not talking about an actual garden in your backyard. Where is the garden? Where is the location where God has designed for you to be a gardener? It's very possible that your garden is your home. It's possible your garden is your neighborhood. It's possible your garden is your office, your car. Your garden is at the warehouse. Your garden is in the restaurant. Your garden is with your coworkers. Your garden is with your clients. Wherever God has placed you and wherever your garden is, be the gardener in the garden that God has given to you. I love what Martin Luther King Jr. said years ago. Spoke of Avidah. Speaking of this, he said this, If a man is called to be a street sweeper, he should sweep streets even as Michelangelo painted, or as Beethoven composed music, or as Shakespeare wrote poetry. He should sweep streets so well that all the hosts of earth and heaven will pause to say, here lived a great street sweeper who sweep the streets well. What does God say about how you tend your garden? What does God say about how you do your work? You might sit back and say, Brian, that doesn't matter. I'm a great worshiper on Sunday morning. Brian, that doesn't matter why I don't do my job well, but I look for opportunities to witness while I'm doing it. Listen, God's called you to be a gardener where you are gardening, and that means that you do it to the best of your ability and with his power. It was the reformer Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King. It was the reformer Martin Luther who uh, quoted Psalm 147, verses 13 and 14. If you're unfamiliar with the verse, it says this, For God strengthens the bars of your gates, He blesses your children within you. He makes peace in your borders. He fills you with the finest wheat. Leave that verse up if you can just for a second, guys. He then asks the question, how does God do those things? How does God strengthen the bars of your gates? How does God bless your children? How does God make peace in your borders? How does God fill you and I with the finest wheat? Here's what Martin Luther said, clear back in the 1500s. He said, he strengthens the bars of your city by city planners and architects, by politicians who pass good laws to protect the city. He blesses our children within our midst through the work of teachers, through the work of pediatricians, through the work of those who are involved in child care. How does he make peace in our borders? By means of good lawyers and policemen and those who work in the law enforcement field and the military field. How does he fill us with the finest of wheat? By farmers and by factory workers and by restaurant owners. In other words, Martin Luther said this, that God fulfills this verse by using you and I in our everyday tasks, things that we would think were unspiritual, our normal eight to five job. God uses us in those vocations to fulfill his will and to bring about his purpose and his plan in our world. 
So the first truth I want you to get is this, like Adam and Eve, you are commanded to work the garden that God has given to you. The second thing that I would say is this, like Adam and Eve, you have been given the raw materials of the earth to develop them for the glory of God and for the benefit of humans. In other words, God has created the earth. He's given us the raw materials. He's handed them to us. And he's told us, listen, this is your responsibility to take the, 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 the raw materials that I have made. And you with your creativity, you with your passion, you with your intelligence, you with your work, you with your hands that I have given you. You take those materials and, and you use them for the glory of God and for the benefit of other humans. Do you remember the word God used to describe his works of creation there in Genesis chapter 1? Every time God made something, he made a declaration about it, didn't he? He made the light and he made the darkness and he sat back and said what? It is good. He made the land and he made the sea and he sat back and said it is what? It is good. He made the plants and he sat back and said they are good. After each thing he created, he said it was good. Think with me today. Good is good, but good is not perfect. Now, that's not saying God's creation wasn't just as he wanted. The word, the Hebrew word that is used there means good. It means usable. And so the idea I believe and others believe is that, is that God gave Adam and God gave us these raw materials and he gave us the ability to take those raw materials and perfect them and use them for his honor and for his glory. You might understand this. Husbands, you might look at your wives today and say, man, you look incredibly beautiful today. Your hair is made. Your makeup is just the way it ought to be. You look beautiful in that outfit that you're wearing. Why, right now, you look perfect. When she woke up this morning, she was good. <laughs> now, she's perfect, right? In the morning, she had all of the raw materials that she needed to, to, to arrive at perfection. And now she's arrived at perfection. I believe that's what's taking place here in the Garden of Eden. God, God has given us the responsibility. He's given us everything that we need to work with our hands, to worship him, to take what he has given us and bring honor and glory to him. Man, a painter takes those paints and a canvas and a brush and comes out with a beautiful masterpiece who gave that painter the ability to do that? It was God who gave that painter the ability to do that. A chef takes all the ingredients of a meal, and sometimes I'm amazed like you to sit back and, and, and look at, at some of these culinary perfections that these chefs, if you ever watch Chopped or, or some of those shows where they say, okay, here's what we're going to give you. We're going to give you chocolate and asparagus and ice cream, and you got to make something out of it. And you sit back and think, how in the world can you make something out of those ingredients? And if you watch the show, they walk out sometimes with some of these things that are absolutely incredible, and they taste, from what the people say, they taste well as well. Maybe it's just a TV program, I don't know. Like Adam, you have been given the raw materials of the earth to develop them for the glory of God. When you go to work tomorrow, go with the understanding that you are going to bring glory to God. You are going for the purpose of honoring him and blessing those around you. You see, the truth is this. God intended for our work to be an act of worship. There's the second thing that I want us to see. The second truth is this. God intended for you to give him your whole life as an act of worship. You see, God not only wants your work to worship him and your, and your songs that you sing to worship him, 
But God desires that every single aspect of your life, your whole life, be an act of worship. We call that whole life stewardship. The fact that, that God, God is over all of our life and God desires that all of our life would honor and glorify him. Let me read two verses. Turn with me, or maybe you already have your finger there still in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Notice what Paul says. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Paul says this, I, do, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Don't be conformed to this world. In other words, be different from the world in your actions, in your thoughts, in the way that you do things. Don't be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewal, the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, what is acceptable, and what is perfect. Let me put all of this into context for you this morning in, in the book of Romans. In verse, uh, chapters 1 through 3 of Romans, Paul lays out the fact that all of us have a spiritual need Romans 3.23, for all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3.10, there is none righteous, no, not one. In verse, or chapters 3 through 5, he describes that Christ, or in Christ, we have received the divine provision necessary for our salvation. Even though we're sinners, Jesus Christ made the provision for us. That's the gospel. In chapters 6 and 7, we see that we have new life in Christ. Romans chapter 8 is the crescendo of God's grace where the Apostle Paul talks about all that we have and all that we are in Christ Jesus. Chapters 9 through 11, he talks about God's dealings with the people of Israel. And in chapter 12 in verse 4, he talks about God in action in our lives. Having been forgiven, having been redeemed, now possessing the Holy Spirit of God, having everything that God and his grace has given to us, what does the Christian life now look like for us? So Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore. The word therefore goes back to everything that he's written so far. Understanding all that God has done for us, what is expected of us. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you and I do what? We present our bodies to him as a living sacrifice. And if you notice the end of verse 1, he says, this is what? This is your spiritual worship. So here he's talking about worship. He doesn't even mention singing. Here he's talking about worship. He doesn't even mention, you know, you know what type of music we use or whatever. And by the way, if, if your view of worship this morning is that, well, worship is this or worship is this or it should be done this way, you have an erroneous view of worship. Well, worship is about us giving ourselves to him. It's a sacrifice that we give ourselves to him. So a couple of practical applications that we can make today. If you have your outline, the first is this, and a little tricky wording here, but follow me. Worship is not part of us being offered occasionally, but all of us being offered continually. Do you get that? Worship isn't part of me being offered occasionally to God. It's not like, okay, I'm going to come to church on Sunday and I'm going to give him an hour of my time. I'm going to give him my mouth and I'm going to give him my ears. And man, is he pleased with the fact that I do that. Worship is not me giving part of me to God occasionally. True worship, Paul says, is giving all of me to him 
continually. Let me go back to our original description of worship. Worship is the whole life response. Head, heart, hands. Worship is the whole life response. Head, heart, and hands in worship to who God is and what he has done. Last, let me make a statement. I might step on your toes because I stepped on mine this week. You see, you cannot truly worship with your mouth if you're not worshiping with your heart. You cannot truly worship with your mouth, no matter how loud you sing, no matter what you sing. You can't worship God with your mouth if you're not worshiping him with your heart. Because if you're doing that, all you're doing is singing the words. It's not real. It's not sincerity. You cannot worship with your heart if your body is not dedicated to him. I, I, I get turned off. I'm going to be honest. I get turned off with, with, with a little bit of contemporary Christianity because in contemporary Christianity, we can worship one way on one day, and we can live the way we want the rest of the week. And the Apostle Paul is saying, no, true worship is the presentation of your body to Christ as a living sacrifice to him. Where you sit back and say, God, I give all of who I am to you, 24-7, my thoughts, my words, my actions, what I see with my eyes, what comes out of my mouth, what I do, where I go, all of me, God, belongs to all of you. That's worship, church. That's worship. Notice how Paul describes the dedication of our bodies. He said, present your body as what? A living sacrifice. And then he puts two adjectives beside it. How does he describe it then? A living sacrifice, how? Holy. The word holy is, is, a, is a phenomenal word that's used. We just sang it. We read it in Psalm 99. We sang it in the song. It's a word that literally means set apart. It, it means, to, so, so the vessels in the temple, the vessels in the temple were consecrated and holy. That they were set apart for that use. They weren't used for anything else. It's not like, it's not like Samuel, the, the prophet, was throwing a pizza party on Saturday night and said, oh my word, we ran out of cups and 7-Eleven is closed. Go to the temple and get those gold cups that we use for worship on Saturday. He couldn't do that. Why? Because those, those vessels were consecrated. They, they were holy. They were set apart for a specific use. That's the same word that Paul uses. God desires for you to present your body as a living, holy sacrifice. That is what? That is acceptable to God. You see, the truth is this, it is when we offer our complete self to him as a living sacrifice, he is really worshipped. So here's what I wrote in my notes. Aren't you glad he doesn't require a dead sacrifice? Can I get an amen this morning? He's not saying, okay, the knives are in the back of the auditorium. Please make sure and step on the plastic before you sacrifice yourself today. He says, listen, I want you to give yourself as a living sacrifice. Why is that? Why, why do we not have to offer ourselves as a dead sacrifice to him? Notice this in your outlines. This is so powerful. Jesus offered himself in death to give us life. We offer ourselves in life to give him worship. 
He doesn't sit back and say, man, I gave my life for you, now give your life for me. No, through his death, we experience life. And through his life, he deserves our worship. Not just Sunday morning from 10 o'clock to 11.30. Not just during the worship service when we sing. He is worthy, church. He is worthy. Would you say that with me today? He is worthy. Say it with me. He is worthy. He is worthy of our praise. He is worthy of our worship. He is worthy of our honor. He is worthy, not just Sunday morning, but Monday morning when you don't feel like it, and Tuesday morning when you don't feel like it, and Wednesday night when you work late, and Thursday, man, when your boss gets all over you, and Friday when you're grateful it's the weekend. He is worthy. Why is that? He gave his life in death so you might have life. And the only thing he asks in return is that you give your life for him and worship. I'm asking you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice to him. What a beautiful picture of the gospel. He died so that we might live. We live so that he might be worshiped. Church, catch this. We exist for the purpose of worshiping him. We exist for the purpose of worshiping him. I love the words of John Piper. John Piper makes this statement. Think about it. He says, missions exists because worship doesn't. In other words, we evangelize, whether it's local or whether it's around the world, we evangelize because there's people around the world who do not worship him. And, and he, he is worthy of not only our worship, but everyone's worship. If we're only worshiping between 10 and 1130 on Sunday, we're not fulfilling our purpose. We're not. You see, the gospel, understanding the truth of the gospel, motivates us to worship. In a few moments, we're going to sing a song that goes like this. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a Savior. Isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah. What's the idea? The gospel, understanding the truth of the gospel changes not only our mindset, it changes not only the fact that we didn't used to go to church on Sunday morning, but now we go to church on Sunday morning. It changes who we are Sunday and Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday. It helps us to worship him every single day because he is worthy of all of our lives. The last thing I say is this, true worship, we've already said it a hundred ways, but let me say it again. True worship encompasses every day of the week, everywhere we go, and everything we do with everyone we meet. Did you catch that? True worship encompasses every day of the week, everywhere we go, everything we do with everyone we meet. How would that revolutionize your life? If you woke up tomorrow morning and you realized that worshiping Jesus is just important tomorrow at work as it is today. How would it revolutionize your walk? How would it change the way you live? How would it change the way that you and I confront temptation? How would it change the way that we relate with our coworkers? How would it change the way we do our jobs? if we were motivated and driven by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we understood, we really understood who Jesus was, what he has done for us, and what he expects of us in return. Worship is not just a Sunday event. Let me encourage you to wake up tomorrow realizing that Jesus is worthy of your worship. Let me encourage you to worship him on Tuesday. 
Let me encourage you to worship him every day of the week. Worship him at work. Worship him at home. Worship him at gym. Yes, worship him watching the Dolphins game this afternoon. <laughs> that means you've got to watch your language a little bit while you're watching the Dolphins game. Worship him in everything you do with everyone. Church, here's the, the walkaway point today. It's this. It's only when we completely surrender ourselves to him that we are able to truly worship. Here's what, here's what I'm afraid of, and this happens with me too, so this isn't Brian passing judgment on you. Here's what I'm afraid of. We're really good at going through the motions. We, we've got the, re, the religious rituals down. We've got them down. We know when we're supposed to stand, when we're supposed to sit. We know when we're supposed to sing, when we're not supposed to sing. We know how we're supposed to act and how we're not supposed to act. But we got it. We got it but it really hasn't transformed our lives. At times we're no different than the ritualistic religions from which we have been converted. We've just changed our rituals. We've converted from one set of rituals to another set of rituals. And Jesus doesn't desire for us to be ritualistic. He doesn't desire for us to just have these forms and customs that we go through. He's real. He's alive. He gave his life for you and me so, so that we might experience life and life more abundantly in him. Now let's not misinterpret what that means. That doesn't mean that that you get a Rolex, or that you get to drive a Lexus. It means that in him you have joy in the midst of trials. It means that you have the, the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit of God whenever tr struggles come in your life. It doesn't matter what's happening. He not only just gives you something, he gives you himself. And he says, I've died so that you might live. And I want you to live so that I may be worshipped. Have you given yourself to him? I'm not asking today whether there was a moment in your life when you made a conversion experience. I know most of us here today have done that. When he talks about presenting your bodies as a living sacrifice, it's not a one-time action. Oh, yeah, I did that when I was six years old. I don't need to do that again. It, it, it's something that we should do on a regular basis. It's a, it's a daily surrender where, where I realize, okay, God, today I give myself to you as a living sacrifice. And tomorrow I wake up and I give myself to you as a living sacrifice. And Tuesday, I wake up and I give myself to you as a living sacrifice. And God, I can't live holy by myself. I cannot please you on my own. I desperately need the power of the gospel to live through me. And so today, I surrender myself to you, asking you to do in me and through me what I'm incapable of doing myself. Help me to make my work an act of worship. In my head, my heart, my hands, my feet, my knees, my ears, worship 